it's the hero show welcome to the hero show everybody starring the unwavering john hersey and the irrepressible andrew bernstein i am andrew bernstein and you are indubitably john hersey how you doing this morning john i'm great you know the birds are outside chirping it's like practically spring here already it's just a beautiful day beautiful day to honor another great hero how are you doing i'm doing i'm doing great john yeah i'm looking forward to this also and a, and a lesser known hero not you know recently we've been doing michelangelo and leonardo and thomas jefferson real giants everybody knows them but but today's hero you want to introduce him today's hero is not nearly as uh, as widely known as he should be and yet as americans you know we live to eat so somebody who enormously maximized food production is definitely a hero so who we got today john absolutely yeah, the father of the quote-unquote Green Revolution, Norman Borlaug, uh, 1914 to 2009. By the way, his birthday is March 25th, so it's right around the corner. I think we're doing this in, yeah. at, at a good time. Right, and he 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 lived to he lived to be what 95, right? So it 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 shows you that you know growing growing food and hopefully you know partaking of the harvest is uh, is conducive to to health and long you know longevity so you know, he's a, he's a real american hero and he's a hero since he fed uh, helped feed so many people around the world i mean he's i'm, I'm sure he's i'm sure we wouldn't get an argument from anybody in india you know uh, you know in parts of asia uh, where the green revolution was so beneficial to human life i'm sure we wouldn't get any argument from people there about what a hero uh, you know he, what a hero he is he is a worldwide hero, absolutely. Yeah, countries around the world have benefited from him and, and continue to benefit from his innovations in agriculture today. But uh, right. came from humble beginnings, like many of our heroes, right? Uh, yes. Grew up on a 100-plus yeah. acre farm in Iowa. And that and that I doesn't my, toughen yeah. you, that does. Yeah, I know. I went to college in South Dakota, you know, and many of my, my friends they were, were, were from Iowa. Yeah, they, they were throwing around bales of hay and stuff, you know. It does it does make a man out of you, that, that's for sure. Oh, but, but also that name, I think his, uh, his family is, is of Norwegian descent. Is, is, that, that's right. is that right? It reminds me of mm -hmm. uh, uh, ba the Balrog in, uh, in Tolkien. You know, you remember that monster? Uh -huh. Anybody who's anybody who's read Tolkien, and I love Tolkien. Yeah. We got to do a hero show episode on, on him uh, oh. know, at, at, at some point because the heroism in the in the you know, Lord of the Rings trilogy is just off the charts. But the Balrog, you know, was a fearsome monster, and I remember Gandalf saying something like, "There's more dangerous things, you know, in the earth than uh, than, than orcs." You know, <laughs> and, and I keep think I keep forget I keep forget Balrog's name. I keep thinking Balrog, you know, from uh, from Tolkien. But Bal the Balrog was a fearsome monster, whereas Balrog is a, is a is a great hero. But yeah, uh, humble beginnings on a, on a farm on a farm in in Iowa. He was working, you know, he was working on the farm as a, as a kid. And uh, what was the what the key? <laughs> One, one, one thing that I love, John, about his early life is that he was educated in a one-room schoolhouse with one teacher, you know? And that's, uh, yeah. that's, that's humble beginnings, right? Built in 1865, and it still stands today. It's uh, apparently owned by uh, the, the association that you can go see it if you're if you have in Crescow, I think it is, Crescow, Iowa. You can go check it out. Man. But, uh, I have I have not been in Iowa in many years. I had, like I said, a lot of friends in Iowa when I was in college. So I spent, you know, I went to you know Mount Marty College in Yankton, South Dakota. With Yankton is right in what they call the tri-state area. It's right on the border of you know Nebraska and Iowa. It's right you know where those three states meet. So I spent a lot of time in Iowa, in, but that's 1970s. I haven't been there. Uh, in a, in, a, in a long time. I'll tell you one thing, though. You know, Nebraska is known as the Cornhusker State, you know, and a lot of corn. Well, the Iowans always disputed that. The best corn, they always told me, comes from Iowa. And uh, I can't disagree. The, the Iowa corn is, uh, is delicious. But anyhow, yeah, yeah I'm one, I can't even imagine the 20th century. Huh? Oh, I was just going to say he grew up raising corn along with uh, cattle, pigs, and chicken and um learning to fish and hunt at a young age so th this experience i think this youth experience really tough 
around him, but the credited most for building his confidence for the rest of his life was his, his sports activities. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you so know, he, he was, was he was the wrestler, the wrestler, yeah. right? Football, baseball, wrestling. He loved baseball. In fact, when he moved to Mexico, he actually introduced Little League to Mexico because he wanted his kids to play baseball. But he was, uh, uh-huh. yeah, he, he made it to the Big Ten semifinals in wrestling. And his coach would always say, you've got to give it 105%. And that, that was something that stuck with him. And he always taught his kids and grandkids. And he, he always asked, like, are you, are you doing sports? And he was always trying to get them involved in sports. And he thought that, you know, finding that effort this, this learning to lose and this tenacity of picking yourself back up. Uh, if you combine that with, with just this, uh, this confidence that you gain, you can really build a great life for yourself and, and you'll happen upon these sort of serendipitous moments that just happen for you. And as we'll see, they, they did for him. Yeah. And, and I, I agree I, and on, on all, all of those counts. I've always been a big sports fan, especially baseball. You know, as, as baseball season's coming, John, I'm, I'm really, you know, looking forward to that Yankees, if they could stay healthy, have a the terrific Yankees team. Are... No Red Sox. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, God, gee, please stop, stop. You don't want me to throw up in the middle of the hero show. But... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, Yankees, Yankees, Red Sox rivalry transcends all of this, all of this stuff. But I, first of all, I, I can't even imagine going as, as a kid from Brooklyn. I can't even imagine going to a one room schoolhouse with 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 one teacher like like you know uh, like like Borlaug did. And uh, just as an aside here, can you imagine how difficult that would be to teach? Because if there's only if there's only one room, you have every different gradation of age you might have you might have kids if it's a if it's an eighth grade elementary school you might have kids with six years old you know who by the cookie cutter mentality of the public schools would be in the first grade and kids 13 years old who would be in the eighth grade and you've got one one teacher she's got and usually i usually these teachers were, were, were women who were, who were usually very dedicated to educating their kids i'd often smuggled phonics in you know when the when the Department of Education was opposed to it. Uh, but I can't imagine how difficult that is to teach. So, you know, uh, good for the, you know, good, good, good for the teacher who was able to educate this future giant in the fields of agronomy and, and agriculture. And sports, yeah, absolutely. I was very happy my daughter played uh, volleyball in high school. I was, on a, I was on a volleyball team because, amongst other things, you know, the the the, the discipline required, um, you know, to be part of a team, you know, to play team sports or, or you know, or individual sports like like wrestling. The discipline required to be good at to work out, exercise, and you know, at, at practice, and then the physical fitness. There's no underestimating, you know, the importance of physical fitness. Too many, too many really intelligent people just sit around on their rear end and they, you know, they they don't exercise. And, um, you know, as a writer, I can't remember that name, John. It was a Japanese novelist. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. But he wrote, he wrote a bunch of books. He was, he, he was famous. Uh, probably still is. But uh, he, he talked about the physical fitness required to, you know, to be, to be focused, you know, on writing. There's a certain, there's a mental energy that's required, but there's also a physical energy that, that's, that's required to do that kind, of, that kind of work. And sports... Sports certainly facilitates that. So, you know, I'm not surprised that Borlaug lived to be 95 and was able to accomplish all these great deeds. You know, I think sport, sport certainly helps with that. Yeah, there's this mind-body integration. And the better you look and feel, mm-hmm. the better you're going to be able to think. So it's uh, commendable that this author you're talking about realized that. And uh, so early on, I think Borlaug's life was very much centered on developing his physique. But his he, he looked up to his grandfather greatly his grandfather Nels Borlaug, who was from Norway, as you mentioned, he's Norwegian descent. And his grandfather said to him, you know, you're wiser to fill your head now if you want to fill your belly later. And it was, you know, Norman, <laughs> he grew up on the farm and, and uh, he, he worked the farm, but he, he decided to go with his grandfather's advice and quit the farm and to go to university. And as we know, you know, he, he actually took the entrance exams and failed the first time, but he was able to Join a two-year college at first, and uh, eventually matriculate into the forestry program there. So huge right. I was, step forward in his right. life. Right, 
Oh, there's a whole bunch of points. There's a whole bunch of points you just raised. I want, want I want to comment on John. But you, you, first, you, yeah, mind body integration. You know, what I mean, you're you're absolutely right. And we know today, and I think people probably sensed, you know, in the in the past that the exercise, uh, strenuous exercise, increases the blood fl flow to the brain, and you know, and mm -hmm. and so is is certainly. I I know like. If I come home at night, you know, after dinner, and, I, and I'm tired, if, you know, and I don't, you know, I don't feel like doing any work. If I get on the treadmill for like just, you know, even 20 minutes on the on the treadmill, I, I, it, I'm, I'm energized, you know, and I could get another hour or two of, of writing in, and then the, I think, you know, the, the exercise, dunk some, oh, yeah. yeah, some hoops, yeah, yeah there, there you go, you go dunk there some hoops, yeah. Oh, by the way, Iowa is a big basketball state. I mean, it's a, it's a. Yeah. Big basketball state. And my first novel, Heart of a Pagan, of course, a basketball swoops a great basketball play, and it takes place in well, most of it takes place in Iowa. But but anyhow, yeah, that, the the blood flow to the brain, I think, is is a tremendous benefit of uh, you know of, of strenuous exercise. This is, as a personal note, you know, my my dad died of Alzheimer's, so I think you know I think you know for, for me it has uh, horrible disease. For me, it has you know. Of uh, uh, particular in, in importance. Uh, second, second point, important point that you raised on that great quote from his grandfather. You know, fill your head now so you can fill your belly later. I mean, that really gets it philosophically right. As Ayn Rand points out in, in Atlas Shrugged, the human intelligence is responsible for all these achievements, including the revolutions in, in agriculture. And so you develop the mind as a means to you know feeding the body. And when I saw that quote. Uh, the other day when I was doing some research, it reminded me of uh, the Marxist playwright Bertolt Brecht, you know, who said, mm -hmm. uh, a food first, then ethics. You know, you know, that's a good Marxist. It's a good Marxist life, <laughs> you know. You know, the, the, yeah. with, with, he's the, Marxists are materialists. Everything's matter. You and I are bodies. Consequently, manual labor comes first. Manual labor is is all important. So we need, you know, we need to do the bodily work before the philosophy or any intellectual development. You know, that's that's just that's just, Bor Borlaug's grandfather was a much wiser man, and you know, in in, in this regard than than Bertolt Brecht. Uh, and the, other, the other point that I, that occurred to me when you were talking is great. How many times have we seen, you know, on the Hero Show, you know, where we see where, where somebody didn't get into school or got kicked out of school or wasn't a good student when when they were young and everything? Here's here's, here's the one of the greatest agricultural scientists of history, maybe the, maybe the greatest. He's a giant. Didn't get into the University of Minnesota, you know. Uh, um, it's it's uh, it's it's really interesting, and I know soon next week. In fact, we're going to discuss the great Thomas Edison, right? Going back to famous towering giants, and uh, I read Edison's biography many years ago, and uh, recalled that he 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 got kicked out of the fourth grade. The, the headmaster <laughs> told his mother that the kid's brain was addled. You know, so there's something interesting. There's something, but he did okay. You know, there's something interesting about this. Yeah, there's something okay. we need to, uh, <laughs> something we need to understand. And I think one part of it is uh, what people do when they're young, you know, in, in childhood or in adolescence, is not necessarily a reflector of what they're going to do as adults. You know. And uh, there's, there's or maybe certain... it's just like a reverse correlation there, where they're like the worst. No, I don't. I don't think that's it. But you know, the other thing we talked about education on this show, and I'm sure we'll talk about Maria Montessori at some point. But you know, somebody who's very intelligent probably has a hard time with the type of education that is is commonly offered. I don't know how it was when Borlaug went to school, but uh, you know. It, it, I, I think there's probably a correlation there. You know, how good is the is the quality of the education? How uh, how interesting is it, and and does it capture the imagination of somebody who's who's clearly brilliant or goes on to be? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a really important point. The schooling, you know, uh, that line ascribed to Mark Twain, although I think somebody else actually said it first that I never let my schooling interfere with my education. Uh, you know, in an in an ideal world, your schooling would enormously enhance your education, but we don't live in an ideal ideal world and the schooling especially in the united states say is terrible 
And so you could see why some, you know, really bright kid might be turned off. And Borlaug's experience, again, the one-room schoolhouse with, you know, uh, with one teacher. And uh, you got to be a whole bunch of kids of different, you know, different age levels. You don't know how much, you know, school, how much attention the teacher was, was actually um, able to give him. But another point, John, a lot of the heroes that we've been discussing are, are, are men, you know, males. And uh, a lot of us, when we're kids... We have other interests besides your know, education, and I've seen it as a, as a teacher. Most of my best students are girls. The girls, as a general rule, there's always exceptions because people are individuals. But the girls generally take you know the education seriously. Whereas a lot of the boys, you know, I mean, when I was a kid, I was more interested in playing baseball. I mean, no, I take that back. I was always a bookworm. I love books, but you know, I, but I love sports, you know, and I wanted to be out. You know, and a lot of boys. You know, when that's that's their interest when 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 they're young, sports, meeting girls. You know, they have other things on their mind. You know, and so Bullock was an athlete. And, you know, and and in high school, played three different sports. And I wonder, you know, he might not have been as interested in studying. But then when we, what did they say? I don't know if this is true, John, but you know that they say that girls often mature emotionally, you know, faster than than boys do. And you know that that Seems may that be way. true. But anyway. Yeah, it does. It does. And when the boys catch, when the boys' emotional development catches up, then they get serious, you know. And uh, you see, Borlaug, Borlaug certainly got serious. We went on to get a a, a PhD in uh, what was it, plant pathology and genetics at the University of Minnesota. As you know, you know, he was working hard yep. by that time. Yeah, and in uh, the late part of his bachelor's degree, he just happened to attend a, a lecture by. Uh, the agronomist E.C. Stakeman, he gave a talk called These Shifty Little Enemies Who uh, who Assault Our Crop or Destroy Our Crops. And he talked about breeding techniques for eliminating rust. This, you know, it, it looks like rust. When you, when you look at a plant, there's a, some sort of uh, 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 infection that's attacking it and killing it. And he said that this lecture changed the course of life. And, you know, he, he talked to Stakeman. He was uh, interested in maybe pursuing an advanced degree in forestry. But Stakeman talked him out of that and talked him into pursuing a PhD in plant pathology. And this really would. Stakeman had a huge impact on the trajectory that he would take. Also at this time, though, you've got to think about this. This is the, the mid-1930s. So it's the height of the Great Depression. And, means, you know, FDR had all these make work programs at the time. Uh, and uh, Borlaug joined the Civilian Conservation Corps, and he was working with these people that were starving. You know, he, he said that he saw how food changes people, and it really left scars on him. He was thinking, if it's this bad here in the U.S., can you imagine other places around the world? This is a huge problem, and it, you know, it, that sort of challenge uh, really, really brought him, uh, brought the best. That to, to be motivated to attack this problem so right right and and 1930s you're absolutely right great depression also this is the midwest and the dust bowl you know was was a a big part uh, of the suffering then it's interesting because you look back on it now you know the the droughts of the of the 1930s and the the intense heat you know, made it very difficult to 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 grow crops, and uh, it's interesting. Uh, it caused a great deal of of starvation and 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 suffering back then, like like you just mentioned, as Paul I've observed firsthand. But just as an aside, looking back on it now, I've seen a number. You know, from the the um, global warming, climate change perspective, I've seen a number of scientists are right, and I think this is true. Uh, that the the high you know the the modern warm period roughly the 20th century and continuing into the 21st century the the highest temperatures were in the first half of the of the 20th century not today you know the the, the most of the most of the warming I know I know Fred Singer you know was a was a very uh, accomplished climate scientist and died a couple of years ago in his mid 90s like like Borlaug. Uh Fred Singer pointed that out and, and other people the highest temperatures were in the in the first half of the 20th century in the 19 1920s and, and 1930s. Uh, and so, but that that contributed to the droughts and the you know the and the food the 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 the, the heat waves and the great difficulty uh, the heat waves and the drought made it much more difficult in in the parts of the Midwest Oklahoma and through the, you know, through that through that area which is not that far from Iowa uh, uh, made it much more difficult to, to grow crops and you're right uh, it's the, it, it 
I think that helped motivate Borlaug to to try to uh, what, what can we do to grow more food? You know, I think yeah, sometimes painful stuff is a motivator. You know, it's, it's, it certainly yeah. can. Be. Yeah, he you know he's out in the field seeing what was going on, and he'd go into Minneapolis and, and see the bread lines, and just thought this is this is he. And um, you know, he, he graduated in forty two with his PhD and had planned to go to DuPont. He had already landed a job with DuPont. And um, then that fateful day, December 7th, 1941, as FDR said, a day that will forever live in infamy, the uh, Japanese attack Pearl Harbor and Borlaug his mind. He, he wants to enlist in the army. But uh, yeah. DuPont had been converted for war research. And so the, there are certain regulations at the time and they actually rejected his, his uh, bid to get into the army. So, um, which is faithfully, he does go on to DuPont and he does some great work that, that actually really helps the war effort. Right. Right. He sure, he, he sure does. Uh, it's interesting. Oh, by the way, I just want to go back to, since, since, uh, global warming, climate changes, I'm, I'm like a, your fanatic ab about this. <laughs> I just want to point out the, the highest temperatures, certainly in the United States, early, uh, most states, the highest temperature early 20th century, which is before the World War II industrial boom that spewed a great deal of man-made carbon dioxide into the air. So that's a major problem for the AGW hypothesis. But that's not our, yeah, but that's not our topic for today. Um, Bola, you know, one of the things he did early in his career in 1942 was develop a glue that was re to, to the warm, you know, seawater, you know, in the in the in the South Pacific was 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 so important because the Marines on Guadalcanal. It's 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 interesting when you that was a bloody battle from everything I've read about it. And I have to say, since you know, I'm I'm old, John. Although I'm, actually, I should say that I'm feeling I'm feeling good. But you know, I was born in 1951, so I'm going to be 70. Can I going to be 70 years old? So I can't even I can't even believe it. Um, but. Uh, uh, I knew World War II vets, you know, in, in 1961, I'm 10 years old. So that's, you know, 19 years after Guadalcanal. If those guys were 20, you know, if those guys survivors were like, I'll say they were 22 years old in, you know, in 1942, then, you know, 19 years later, you know, they're 41 years old. These guys were, you know, and I was, these guys were some, some tough dudes, you know. Um, but the United States went on to so obliterate the Japanese Navy and, and, and decimate, well, more than decimate the military. It's hard to remember today that in 1942, the Japanese controlled, Japanese Navy controlled the oceans and the, and their, uh, their, uh, the, the planes off their aircraft carriers controlled the skies. And so the Marines, I don't know, I even know how the Marines were able to land on Guadalcanal, but in effect, they were stranded. How are we going to supply them? The, you know, the, ja the Japanese controlled the sea, you know, and, and the skies. And they, the, the, what, what the Navy was doing was it was, it was, they were dumping packages of supplies, you know, in, in, into the ocean and by night, I think, I think by, by you know, speedboats, uh, from what I read. Uh, maybe maybe the old PT boats that uh, John Kennedy was a hero on in in, in the Second World War, a, l a legitimate hero, by the way, uh, not a liar, not a liar about his war record like uh, uh, John Kerry did. But uh, by speedboat, they were dumping the stuff in the ocean, you know, and then you had the Marines have to go wade out and get it. But but the package is the uh, they, didn't, they didn't have the glue that was able to keep just together. The packages were just you know were basically disintegrating in the in the seawater. And and Borlaug and his team when they were when they were told about about this, they made they were able. To, I, I think in a matter of weeks, they were able to make mm -hmm. a you know a, an innovative type of glue that was able to withstand the warm seawater and keep the packages together, so the marine on Guadalcanal could be supplied. So that was a you know major uh, boost to the to the U.S. war effort. Yeah, he did that within a few weeks, and then apparently he also went on to do research on uh, canteen actants. Uh, of course, uh, various uh, illnesses were a big problem, and on DDT, he was a lifelong advocate of DDT. And um, I don't know the science on DDT. Of course, there's uh, the, the environmentalist movement was very uh, vocal in, in getting rid of it and, and saying that it had effects on shells and, and bird life and things like that. But uh, 
Orlog looked around and saw how many lives that it had saved. And in fact, even in the, the baby powder uh, that he used for his kids when he was in Mexico because the fleas were so bad. And he also did some, some research on electronics for DuPont. DuPont, a big help in this war effort. And uh, you're right. I mean, after, after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, they had pretty much destroyed most of the American fleet. So America was not a, a dominant Navy at this point. And I'm sure at some point we'll have to talk about Midway. It happened just you know, a month or two before Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal. Right, right. Turning point uh, in the war in the Pacific, and a great movie uh, just a couple of years ago, you know, on uh, on that, which I saw like seven times because you know, I loved, yeah. I, you know, I loved it. It was so heroic. But um, uh, yeah, uh, you know, you mentioned just before talking about DDT and this, and and Bullock's absolutely right for my limited knowledge on this. But a couple of points uh, you mentioned before the it's it's like a spring day in the northeast the birds are chirping and so on well i can remember vividly it was early 1960s uh 61 62 63 sometime in the early 1960s rachel carson published silent spring which became uh, a bible you know of the environmentalist movement and i remember even even you know in, in elementary school the teachers were talking about it and everything and the uh, part of the theme was that you know DDT was the, the widespread use of DDT was going to kill off bird life. It was going to kill off the, the birds that had spring would be silent. You know, there'd be no birds chirping in, you know, in, in your trees uh, um, or, or you know, outside mine, you know, house in the trees. But uh, 19, I think it was 1970, the EPA conducted extensive research on DDT. And I could be misremembering here, John, because I'm not an expert on this, but uh, it's outside my field. But the, the EPA's own research showed that DDT was was lethal to insect life, you know, which is what it's designed for, but had, you know, had no discernible effect on animal life, including birds. But then they went ahead and banned it anyway. Uh, so, you know, uh, and, and, and they require... You know, this ties us right back to Borlaug because a great part of his work was to grow food in third world countries. You know, I, I hate to use that term third world because that Mao, Mao coined that term. But anyway, these, you know, these undeveloped countries, these, these countries, you know, where Borlaug was instrumental in growing so much food. The, uh, the U S government made it mandatory for a lot of these, uh, countries to, to give up DDT in order to receive foreign aid from the, from the United States. And hence malaria made a big comeback in the malaria was on the ropes. The mankind had malaria on the ropes could kill off the, you know, the, the, the disease carrying mosquitoes. Uh, and after the ban on DDT, malaria, you know, made a big comeback and, and, and more human beings are dying of malaria in, in, in various African countries. Now, again, I'm not an expert in this, and I, and I remember, you know, doing sporadic reading on this over, over the years, but that's, that's how I remember. If anybody out there in Hero Land has the facts on this and I'm mistaken, you know, please, uh, please let us know because the truth, the truth is more important than being right. But, but Bullock, uh, to the best of my knowledge, John, Bullock's abso absolutely right that uh, DDT is instrumental in, in killing off, you know, insects that, that, adversely affect human life in, in, in many ways. And, and again, I don't think from what, from what I've read that it has the harm on animal life that Rachel Carson predicted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned, we, we've already talked a little bit about his uh, legacy in food production, and this is really the next step in his career. Uh, back in 1940, the U.S. government was concerned about the uh, food problem in Mexico as they right. were not right. able to feed themselves. And they were, the U.S. was thinking, well, this could cause some sort of mass migration into the U.S. and disrupt our economy. So uh, whatever we can do, we ought to, to try to stimulate food production there. And so uh, they got in touch with the Rockefeller Foundation, who got in touch with Stakeman of Minnesota, uh, Minnesota, and Stakeman, um, you know, he he recommended some people, a guy named George Harar, and Harar uh, ended up reaching out to Borlaug to lead meat research program there to get rid of some of the the rust problem that they were having that was killing a lot of the crops. Um, from what I read, he initially turned down the offer because he wanted to finish his war research at Dupont, but then. 
wars winding down 1944 uh dupont gets wind that, that he's still being considered for this other job and they offer to double his salary. And he says, no, he decides to go do this wheat research in Mexico. And he gets there and at first he thinks, wow, what a mistake I've made. There's no trained right. scientists. There's, there's no facilities. Um, the farmers there are resistant to the ideas that he's bringing, some of them at least. But he, he realizes, okay, we, we need harder strains of wheat. And um, how are we gonna how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna make a, a more resistant strain of wheat? And he starts uh, floating this idea of what became known as as uh, the shuttle system. And this is where mm -hmm. you grow crops in several different regions, shuttle them back and forth. And in time, you can increase the adaptability of a certain crop. But he didn't know this at the time. It was sort of a, a, one of these serendipitous events in his life where um, it, it was a, a opportunity, he thought, to grow two crops in a year because you could grow crops in the northern region during the fall and crops in the southern region during the summer. And so you get two crops, you just food. But they were growing the crops in the north, getting the best seeds, bringing them to the south and vice versa, going back and forth. And what that ended up happening was to just created crops that were called photo period insensitive. So they were less sensitive to the amount of light that they're growing under a variety of conditions. And Borlaug was, I mean, he was so dedicated to this work. Uh, he was traveling back and forth, staying away from his family, sometimes for months at a time, uh, go to the north. And in order to get there, the roads were so bad, he'd have to drive up into Texas and into New Mexico and then down. Uh, just to get to a northern area of Mexico. So, you know, this photo period insensitivity was just the serendipitous thing. And there are, you know, a few other innovations in the crops that, that he came to, uh, to, to create here that I'm sure we'll talk about too. Right, right. And, and I think, you know, part of the reason why he might have been initially resistant to the idea of going to Mexico is let's, let's not forget he had a young child at home and I think his wife was pregnant, you know, with uh, with another, you know, with another child when when he when he left, so you could see why he he might he certainly might have been uh, might have been reluctant. But um, yeah, the the shuttle system that you talk about it's it's sometimes called the uh, double wheat season. You know, there, there, there's two mm -hmm. different there's two different periods here of time in which you could grow. If you if you could if you could if you could grow twice, you know, it's uh, obviously you you have a chance to double to double your output, or at least certainly increase it. And uh, they bred wheat you know, using the using the methods that you just described. They they bred wheat then at locations seven hundred miles apart, uh, ten degrees latitude apart, and eighty five hundred feet altitude apart. And it was uh, you know with uh, it was enormously difficult task to accomplish, but it was a great achievement in the end. And uh, in Mexico you know, had been you know desperate for food. I think there was a semi-starvation levels before that. And, and uh, after, as a result of uh, Borlaug's work, Mexico became a, a food, a, a grain exporter, didn't they? I think they, they were growing yeah. so much wheat, they were able to they were start exporting it. This is such an amazing part of the story. You know, at first, there was so much resistance to this idea of shuttling because people believed that you could only cultivate a, a new strain in the area that you're going to grow it. And that this was just a mess. You know, this guy, Norman Borlaug, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's trained in plant pathology, but not plant breeding. And even his boss, Harar, requested that he stop, you know, not go forward with this idea. And, and Borlaug said, listen, I'm, I'm going to do this or you can have my resignation. And so Stakeman, actually, EC Stakeman stepped in, he interceded and, uh, Borlaug ended up going forward with this plan and it, you know it was extremely successful um not only did they get this photo period insensitivity but crossing the different strains helped to build resistance to various uh, other plant diseases so they got these sort of unintended benefits um the 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 wheat responded really well to the nitrogen fertilizer to grow in wheat uh, unmodified you know it grows very tall and if it's if the really uh good grain it gets heavy and then it starts to buckle 
and and the thing spoils it just it dumps itself on the ground and so uh borlaug had heard of this japanese version of of wheat this uh wheat strain that one of the service members in world war ii had seen in, in japan and it had come back to the us brought back to the pacific northwest and so when borlaug heard about this he started crossing his new trains with this short wheat a dwarf uh, a dwarf strain mm -hmm. came to be called. And yeah, in this period from about 44, when he got there to, to about 63. So like a 19 year period, um, 600% increase in, in Mexican wheat production and 95% of the wheat being grown in Mexico was some strain created by Borlaug. So high yield strains think of as modern wheat. These go back to, to Borlaug's methods of, of crossing, back crossing, top crossing, various crossings of, of different wheat strains to create wheats that are uh, um, you know, adaptable to a wide variety of conditions and, uh, and, and resistant to a, a large variety of diseases and also short enough that they don't buckle over and spoil. So That's just, a uh, tremendous. A huge, yeah. yeah, from, from tremendous. net importer of wheat to that exporter in that period of time. Yeah, it's a tremendously arduous task and a, just a great accomplishment in service of human life. So let me ask you something, Jean, because I know you have much more science background than I do. This is this is considered a type of genetic engineering, isn't it? Is that genetic right? Genetic modification, GMO. Yep. So, yeah, because right. So I remember, you know, there's there's. A teaching, you know, teaching today's moral problems at various schools over the over the years, various college classes, and this would this would you know this is this is often one of the issues that we discuss. It's on the syllabus, uh, and I've had students say repeatedly, "I don't, I'm not eating any genetically modified food." You know, yeah. <laughs> you, you all seem to you're realize it all the time. You're it, yeah, you read it every day, yeah. kid. You know, and <laughs> and so, sometimes. It comes from a religious perspective that this is man playing God. You know, only God gets to decide what types of plants grow. You know, what type of what type of life there there is on Earth. And sometimes it comes from you know the the leftist perspective, the leftist environmentalist perspective of you know human beings are interceding in the environment and they're you know they're, and, and they're going to cause you know they're going to you know rape mother nature and you know and dis you know, destroy the environment and stuff. Uh, and of course, it's all irrational. And uh, the the genetic modification of various crops that use that has the resistance to, to diseases and, you know and, and such has uh, vastly increased the food yield and god knows how many people are are alive today didn't somebody well who's the guy said that Borlaug was responsible for saving a billion human lives was it wasn't wasn't that the number was it a billion uh and so, so if you know, and our good friend Alex Epstein wrote a terrific book, you know, in a, in a different different context about fossil fuels. But the uh, you know, Ayn Rand's theme there is is the same: human life is the standard of moral value. And consequently, you know, uh, uh, developing new strains of of, gra of grain and everything that enables vastly more human beings to live and be fed, not, not you know, not just have like a bowl of rice and 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 you. You're, you're malnourished and you're, you're suffering from rickets and everything, but to be, but to be well nourished and have the energy of, of, of a well nourished body for millions and millions and maybe millions, maybe a billion, you know, human beings. This guy's a hero. I, I think he, sh I think he should have an ep episode of the Hero Show. You know, <laughs> this guy is a, this guy's a bona fide hero. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. It was a billion, right? Yeah, was I, it, I think of this somebody's... conflict. Yeah, and I don't know how these numbers were, were gotten, but I think part of it was what we're going to get to with the, the predictions for the deaths that would occur in, in India and Pakistan. But I think of this right. conflict, it's really interesting because we think of the environmentalists as the green, green but Norman Borlaug is, the, is really the father of the, of the true green, which is the greening not only of, of Mexico, of uh, India and Pakistan and parts of Africa, and his methods have now been transplanted all over the world. So, I mean, he said that genetic modification is not some form of witchcraft, 
but it's the, the progressive harnessing of the forces, the, the forces of nature to benefit and feed mankind. So he, he, he saw the irrationality of this uh, anti-GMO environmentalist outlook. And he just said that there's no credible evidence to suggest that we're going to be uh, injured, either us or our planet, by growing genetically modified organisms and eating them. And uh, we've got to do this. We've got to do this to feed people and to further human life. So, right. That's right. Yeah, he, he took this right. whole uh, movement head on. And I like to think of it as green versus green, but the, the true green is really Norman Borlaug. No, absolutely, absolutely right. I know the enemies of you know the genetically modified food. They sometimes call it Franken food. You know, based you know, on, on Frankenstein, that that would be like you know we're gonna create some mon some monstrosity versions of food that once we ingest them, it's gonna it's gonna harm us and turn us into some kind of you know monsters or you know it's it's gonna harm our, our reproduction process that our children and grandchildren are going to be harmed by it. But Bullock, Bullock's right, to the best of my very limited knowledge, there's no credible evidence to support that and keeping millions and millions of people alive and, you know, and, 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 and well nourished. So, uh, yeah, one, one other thing about greening the earth, going back to, to, to you know, you're right, they, they call the, the environmentalists call themselves greens, and yet they regard, the, the terrible irony is they're fighting this war against carbon dioxide. You know, they, they consider carbon dioxide a pollutant Whereas the tr truth is, carbon dioxide is plant food. It's not a, yeah. it's not a pollute. It's not a pollutant. And you know, because of the warmer weather, the warmer climate of the 20th century, which I think has little to do with carbon dioxide. Actually, it has much more to do with cycles of the sun, you know, and and, and other natural factors. But uh, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere did increase. Uh, the Earth did warm in the 20th century, and the, you know, and and the, the Earth is much more extensively green today than it was a hundred and some odd years ago, uh, you know, in, in large part uh, because of that. And by the way, one last point on, on this. Uh, Dr. Tim Ball, Canadian climate scientist, you know, who's, uh, you know, has done a lot of uh, very good work in the field of climate science. Um, he had a, a meme not a few months ago, you know, pointing out that plants have evolved to flourish at, at you know, well, carbon dioxide levels, I think he said 1,200 parts per million, which is something like that is what they, they do in, in greenhouses, you know, because so, plants flourish. Mm -hmm. He said, how could, how could that have happened if right. levels at 400 parts per million are destructive to the planet? And that's, a, that's an unanswerable question from, you know, from the AGW uh, standpoint of the AGW hypothesis. That's a really good point. Evolution could not have happened if, if, if uh, the evolution of plants could not have happened if, the, uh, if higher levels of carbon dioxide above 400 parts per million were harmful to plants. It's, it would not, they, no, they flourish at like 1,200 parts per million. So uh, green the earth. And uh, Norman Borlaug's, you know, the, no, no, it, it's this is a really important point. Any, I don't, need, we don't need to be scientists to realize that plant life is the foundation of the food chain, right? The herbivores eat the plant life. Uh, carnivores eat the herbivores. <laughs> Omnivores like us eat both. But if uh, what 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 benefits plant life, of course, benefits all life, all life on Earth. And uh, I don't know anybody uh, who's done more. To benefit plant life and 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 breed resistance to disease, than than Norman Borlaug, the f properly known as the father of the of the green revolution. So should we should we get to that? The the, the because the the obstacles in growing uh, increased you know food yields, you know, crop yields in India and Pakistan in the nineteen sixties. Mm. There's so many so many different <laughs> obstacles involved that that Borlaug was able to to overcome. So I, this, this, yeah, is, this, this is an amazing, amazing story. Go ahead. It, well, it starts with this population boom in India and Pakistan and in South Asia in the 50s and food production lagging behind this. And the, you know, the Western economists are sort of sitting back and triaging the different nations and they write off India entirely. There's no chance it's ever going to create enough food 
feed this huge growing uh, population. So they're completely re resigned in apathy. And the, the Indians, uh, you know, they deserve congratulations for, for not just sitting around and saying, okay, I guess we'll starve. They start looking at solution and they find Norman Borlaug. Uh, they reach out to him. And in the early 60s, Borlaug invites scientists from both India and Pakistan to come and check out his program in Mexico and he begins training them there. And uh, so they they arrange a program where he's going to bring uh, hundreds of tons of, of seed over to India and Pakistan and uh, help them plant it and help them uh, fight this this looming famine. But as you said, obstacle after obstacle after obstacle uh, presents itself and uh yeah, it's, you know the it, right go ahead yeah yeah it's unbelievable yeah. i mean india india and pakistan i mean if you know the religion and the politics here it's just it's often grisly uh india is just a hotbed of sectarian violence i mean hinduism is the dominant religion but there's huge you know islamic population the, the you know the sikh population the buddhist population the christian population there's a a, a great deal of 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 anim animosity i mean Hind hinduism is a fascinating religion john i mean i've taught comparative religion and um uh, you know the, the hindus will say things like there are millions of gods and maybe they're all manifestations of ultimately the one God, but uh, to the Islamic year, I mean, Islam is a fervently, maniacally monotheistic religion. I mean, maybe even more so than Judaism, which also is an intensely, you know, monotheistic religion. To the Islamic year, that's heresy, that's blasphemy. Millions of God, that was like one God. And if you don't accept the one God, we're gonna kill you. So there's this long history of religious violence uh, in India, going all the way back to like the, roughly 1000 AD. Uh, by the way, Will Durant, who is as, as credible a source in history as, as I know of, said that the Islamic conquest of India is perhaps the bloodiest story in history. And, you know, and some Indian historians estimate that like 80 million Hindus were killed by, you know, is, Islamic fanatics, so, uh, you know, 500, 1000 know, to 500 years ago. Anyhow, so there's this long history of bloody violence that it still, it continues to this day, especially between, you know, Islam and, and Hinduism. But the Sikhs also, who started out as a pacifist religion, became noted Muslim warrior, warriors against Islam because, you know, uh, it was some Islamic uh, political leader who, who killed, who tortured to death, I think the founder or one of the, one of the leaders of the, of the Sikh movement, they became uh, great warriors against us. And by the way, did you, you ever see the movie? One of my, I'm going to go off on a tangent, here, but, but that's okay. We'll come back to the main point. One of my favorite movies from like 15, 20 years ago, Bend It Like Beckham. Did you ever see that, John? But that, that Sikh, that Sikh uh, kid in England want to, want to be a soccer player, want to play football. David Beckham. I haven't seen that, yeah. but I know who Beckham is. Yeah. Got well, great there. film. I, I, I recommend, I recommend it because it's all about, in this kid, she, she's independent, you know, and, she, and her family wants her to pursue old country, seek values, and it's all about independence versus tradition, and it's and it's great. It's great. Anyhow, her her sister tells her, who's, who's you know, traditional Sikh family, she's engaged to this Sikh guy. Her mother wants her, you know, to marry a Sikh guy, raise Sikh children, cook traditional Sikh foods and everything. So her older sister tells her rebellious younger sister, she says, look, this is how it is, she says in effect. You're going to marry a Sikh guy. You're not marrying a white guy. And she's, uh, she was going out with this Irish guy, I think. Uh, you're not marrying a white guy, she says. You're definitely not marrying a black guy. And you're most definitely not marrying a Muslim. <laughs> she tells us, you can see even in England, even in England, in, in the New World, you know, that, that conflict with Islam uh, uh, is still there. So anyhow, India is this hotbed of sectarian violence. Pakistan, which split off from India, you know, and is is, is Islam, Islamic, uh, is there's constant tensions between the Pakistanis and 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 the Indians. War over the province of Kashmir is is going on. When when uh, Bolak had some some problem with a check, you know, for the for the for yeah. the food stuff, so the, you know, he's, it, what yeah, it was what was the Pak yeah I don't was, it was the, the Pakistani, Pakistani minister or an Indian minister. I think he's, it was a Pakistani he said, minister 
misspelled three different words in in the check, and so it got to right. to Mexico, and they're like, "We're not going to cash this." And then so Borlaug tells him, he's like, "You know what? We'll take care of this, but there are bombs falling in my front yard right now. We just went to yeah, war." That's, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's what he said. He said, "I know you got problems with the check, but I got bombs falling on my lawn." He said, "So you know, we'll take care of this." I mean, it's not funny. There's nothing funny of, of, about this, but you're trying to grow food in the it's midst crazy of, story. of war. Yeah, it is, and, and yeah. you can't make this stuff up. It's uh, you know, it's it's true, but Borlaug persisted. He kept going, didn't he? Yeah, you know, the seed to, it was delayed for months and months, and by the time it got there, it was only it was only addicted to germinate at about ten percent of its normal rate. But finally, he got Borlaug here, basically in the middle of the war zone. Continues his work, continues anyway. He he uh, he reaches out to a lot of young farmers, people that are that are willing to to take a chance on something new that a lot of the more you know, the, the elders aren't really interested in doing. And so he trains them and uh, people start to see, hey, this is working. And by 65, uh, this Japanese Mexican dwarf wheat is growing all over India and Pakistan. Um, it saves, you know, just countless lives, bolsters the economy because now there's a, you know, more demand for tools and technology and labor. And apparently the, the amount that a farmer could gain per, per hectare, you know, about two and a half acres went up from thirty-seven dollars per hectare to 162. So this huge, um, just explosion in the economy and in the quality of living and, um, you know, where's this famine, you know, this, this famine that's being predicted. Nobody right. thinks anyone can do anything about Borlaug and, right. and his technology and, and just his influence in the region. It was very, you know, he, he was a, a great speaker and he did any person at any level, whether it was, uh, you know, the, the kid run out into the field and shooing away the birds or, you know, the head scientists or, or uh, heads of, of state. So he was, he just had this tremendous impact in in uh in south asia which which then filtered out through through much of the world right right i want to say sometimes this is this is uh Borlaug's wikipedia page john and sometimes your know, wikipedia has a has a is, a is a good source of of information and it's contrasting here a uh, Borlaug with paul ehrlich and i and i want to mm. say something ab about ehrlich because you know ehrlich uh 1960, I can remember this because I was a teenager. Ehrlich in 1968 published a book called The Population Bomb, in which he predicted massive worldwide famines by the 1980s, you know, with millions and millions of people starving to death. And predicting that not because dictatorships would suppress economic production, including in the economic sphere. No, 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 no. He's predicting it because the carrying capacity of the earth will have been breached. That the, that the earth is not capable, you know, no matter no matter what type of a political economic system, or no matter what type of scientific advances, his claim is the earth is not capable of of growing enough food to feed the you know, to feed the burgeoning population. So he's a twentieth century Malthusian, you know, Thomas Malthus, uh, uh, going back to the seventeen nineties, his famous works on population, where he he he, he argued that. Now, population growth would inevitably, inevitably outstrip food production, which was more understandable in the 1790s. Although even then, in the early days of the Industrial Revolution, was was proving him proving him false. I think I think all of this is work on the principles of population. I think it was published in 1798, if I remember correctly. In the 19th century, Europe's population tripled. You know, so the Industrial Revolution even then was proving him. Uh, mistaken, but by 1968, you know, there, there was no, there's no excuse for this. And furthermore, you know, the, the people should have known better by 1968 what, what you know, what, what techno science, technology, and industrialization could could accomplish in terms of uh, production, including in the agricultural sphere. But furthermore, the thing that sticks in my craw, John. Ehrlich is a biologist. Paul Ehrlich's a biologist, got a PhD in biology. He's a professor at Stanford. I mean, Stanford, you expect, well, but anyhow. Anyhow, listen to this. This is from, from Wikipedia. Biologist Paul Ehrlich wrote in his 1968 bestseller, The Population Bomb, quote, the battle to feed all of humanity is over. 
In the 1970s and 1980s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. Unquote. Ehrlich said, quote, <laughs> I have yet to meet anyone familiar with the situation who thinks India will be self-sufficient in food by 1971, and India couldn't possibly feed 200 million more people by 1980. Uh, unquote. Well, Ehrlich said he hadn't met anybody. I guess he hadn't met Bullock. Uh, so uh, in 1965, after extensive testing, Borlaug's team you know, began its effort by importing you know, 450 tons of, this, of the dwarf, you know, the, 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 the dwarf seed varieties that you were, that you were discussing before. Went through unbelievable uh, hardships and difficulties because of, uh, because of war and, and the, 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 the check, the, the, the problems with the check that, that you mentioned. But... <laughs> Uh, with his, they, they started planting immediately and often worked in sight of artillery flashes. Can you imagine trying to grow food while the artillery is blasting, you know, is blasting uh, uh, around you? And there were problems with the seeds, which had been damaged by, uh, I think it was over, over fumigation with, with, a, with a pesticide in, uh, in a Mexican warehouse. But eventually, just but, you know, with the perseverance and the genius of uh, Borlaug and his team, they were able to uh, bring these uh, these dwarf uh, grain products that they had perfected in Mexico to Pakistan and India, and just and the, and the upshot is they grew enormously larger uh, amounts of of nourishing food for the Indian and Pakistani populations. Yeah, according to the research that, that I've seen. Pakistan was self-sufficient by 1968, the year that Ehrlich's book came out. And what's really ironic is then two years later, of course, Norman Borlaug is awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in, in helping feed all of these countries around the world. So, right. uh, you know, and, and I think based on the, the evidence available, I mean, obviously he didn't do any, any crack investigative reporting here. But just looking at the uh, readily available stats, maybe er, er, I think Ehrlich is definitely a doomsayer. But if if you discount what Julian Simon called the ultimate resource, uh, if you discount the potential of, of man's mind and just think oh, there's no way it can be done. Yeah. I mean, if you just, just sit hands, there is no way it can be done. But Borla right. and and to credit the, the South Asian people refused to do that. They refused to, to give up an apathy and they, they did it. I mean, they, they not only became self-sufficient, but I think also became grain exporting nations. And, um, you know, Borla went on, on to win. I mean, he, he's, this, this guy is, is absolutely decorated in various awards, but he's one of seven people in history to achieve the trifecta, as it's called the, uh, Nobel peace prize, the, President of Freedom and the Congressional Medal of Honor. And it's really funny, um, you know, when he was being awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor in, in 2007, uh, his, his granddaughter, uh, Julie Borlaug, who also went on to, to actually work in the field and to work with Norman Borlaug, uh, she was sitting behind Bush, who was at the ceremony. And Norman Borlaug was known for for going on and on and on in his talks. Uh, he, he he had a lot to say sometimes, but um, you know he was only given about two minutes. He was only supposed to speak for about two minutes because he's sitting there in front of you know uh, hundreds of of the uh, you know, most important politicians in the free world. And uh, so at at some point, Julie actually reaches over to President Bush and says, uh, you, you think we should so, sort of give him some sort of uh, signed wrap up? And he's like, this isn't a presidential function. It's a congressional function. I don't care. And then a minute <laughs> later, Borlaug says, he says that hunger, poverty, hunger and poverty are fertile seeds of many isms. And terrorism is one of those. And then Bush turns around and says, don't stop him now. And he ends up going on for 42 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> giving this this great speech but uh you know not partisan at all people on both sides uh, applauded his his incredible achievements and it's funny apparently the university of texas where he went on to teach is still updating his resume today because he's given all of these uh, uh, uh honors still even though he passed in in 2009 
And in 2014, uh, the, the uh, U.S. Capitol has honored him with a statue. Actually, the uh, I believe state gifted a statue of North Borgo C in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda. Great, yeah, that's a great a great statue of him. Right, yeah, that's and that's a, that's a hell of a story, John. So, you know, one one more quote here. You, you mentioned the 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 timeline with the, between Ehrlich's book and Borlaug's achievements. By nineteen again from from Wikipedia, uh, Borlaug's Wikipedia page. By nineteen sixty eight, when Earl Ehrlich's book was released, William Gord of the United States Agency for International Development was calling Borlaug's work a green revolution. Unquote. And um, you're absolutely right. I was gonna, I was gonna mention Julian Simon, so I'm, you know, I'm, mm. I'm glad you, you brought, you brought him up, and I, you know, strongly recommend Simon's. Uh, Simon wrote several, but he was a, he was an economist, right? University of Illinois, University of Maryland. He taught at, 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 at several American universities. But his book, uh, The Ultimate Resource, I, you know, I strongly recommend. It's published, I don't know, 1980, 1981, in that range. So it was, you know, 20 odd years after Atlas Shrugged was published. I don't know if Simon ever read Atlas Shrugged or not, or if he developed his ideas independently. But, uh, and, and, we, and we discussed Simon, you know, on, on earlier episodes of the Hero Show, but Simon's thesis, of course, is the ultimate resource. The, the, the main resource is not fertile lands or, you know, coal or iron ore or, or oil. This, this is the ultimate resource, human intelligence. And why Simon's argued against the Malthusian, Ehrlichian, uh, population bomb thesis by saying that uh, more more human beings are not a problem it's a it's a boom because that means there's more human minds there's more, and more potential geniuses and, and dedicated thinkers to work on the problems of human life from a to z from agriculture to zoology or anything in between and simon was a, a basically a free market guy and so i think we can we can add here that that's true on if if capitalism survives and you know and individual rights are protected and there's political economic liberty then simon is absolutely right the more human minds there are under on, on freedom the better uh, the the it means the more great minds will, that will there will will exist and will be able to you know work on the problems of of human life furthermore i think we say i think we have enough know enough about demographics to say that uh, in the capitalist countries, as affluence levels rise, the birth rates tend to tend to decline. Right, the the, the birth rates tend to tend to go down. Uh, I th I think one reason for that, anyway, is that, and I think we discussed this before too. I think one reason for that is when, when individual rights are, are protected, at least to some degree, that means the rights of women are protected. And women can choose to get an education, choose to have productive careers, and marriage and family is not the only form of fulfillment. For, for, for a woman. And we see very often, you know, in, in the free countries, educated, professional women very often still, you know, choose to get married and still choose to have children. But most of the times, you know, they they and their husbands, you know, they have one or two children, not six, you know, like her grandmother had. <laughs> and so I think that's at least one of the reasons why the birth rates go down in the, you know, in the uh, in the free countries. But anyhow, Simon is right. And Borlaug himself was very concerned about the growth of human population. And I think on this, I think Borlaug is mistaken, and Simon, you know, is is absolutely right. Uh, by the way, so I know we're, we're we're running. Go ahead. There's one last point I want to make. But go ahead. Come back to it. Well, you know, just to to carry on with that. I mean, he did make <laughs> several mistakes that we have to mention here. I think that he he certainly justified his cause. It, with a, a very al altruist tone, um, he thought that it was sort of like a duty for people like him to uh, to devote their lives to feeding the free world or feeding the world. Um, and he had some sort of uh, mistaken views about the nature and role of government. But these are problems that he he held in common with half of mankind, and they're not the things that make him stand out. And it's really mm -hmm. those things that are important about him. You know his his incredible perseverance and drive to create these wheat varieties and to uh, pioneer these these means of growing these resistant strains that uh, that made his legacy and make him a true hero. Right, I mean it's his it's his genius, his work ethic, his productiveness that make that makes him a uh, hero. And you know, 
people who often good people like Bullock may it's like in theory they they support altruism it's what they've been taught um whether whether through the religion or through so you know the socialist uh in 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 the colleges and in the school system and such but this is self-fulfilling isn't you can imagine the inwardness of it the pride that Norman Borlaug took and be able to reach these achievements, be able to uh, promote human life in, in, in such a, uh, you know, in such a deep and profound way. This is enormously egoistic. People, people at that level, you know, they, you know, they tend to be very quietly confident and, and quietly proud. They don't have to go around boasting about their achievements because they know in here what they've accomplished. So this is, this, this, the, that's the egoistic motive, you know, like Howard Rock says in The Fountainhead, my all-time favorite book. Uh, we have to discuss Howard Rock on the Hero Show one day, you know, as mm. another fictional character. Definitely. But um, yeah, he said, you know, in order to excel at something, you have to you have to love the doing. And um, you know, the, the hours that Norman Borg put into this, and the obstacles he overcame, was was from love. Uh, so the, yeah. this, this is egoistic. I have no, whatever, whatever lip service he pays to, to self-sacrifice. This is not a self-sacrifice on Bulldogs, but this is the love of yeah. his life. This is the passion of his life. He was but accepting you know, uh, an award, I believe. Um, just tying into that, he was accepting an award when I think he was 90. And we know he died when he was 95. And, and when he was, he was 90, he said, you know, I want to keep working. I want to die with my boots on. And he, he did. I mean, he, he worked up to within a, a couple of years that so uh, what an incredibly productive life yeah 95 years and you know and, and did tremendous work i want to say i just want to pat the nobel committee on the back for a second because yeah. i would have expected if you had told me this story i didn't know the ending i would have expected that they would have given the nobel peace prize to paul ehrlich not to yeah. not to norman Bollock, but because i mean they've given it to to people like Yasser Arafat, who's a bloody-handed terrorist, and they gave it to Al Gore for spewing out lies about global warming. So I figured they would have given it to Ehrlich, not to Bullock. So I commend them for having like a, a moment of rationality where they realize, wait a minute, human life's important. Feeding human beings is, is, is important. And Bullock did this par excellence. So congratulations to the Nobel Committee for getting this, getting this one right. Absolutely. Well, I think we've done Norman Borlaug justice, and uh, the hero show next week is we're, we're going to do Thomas Edison. Is that correct? I guess so, we'll see. No, I think we're committed now. Yeah, let's do Edison <laughs> next week. Uh, yeah, well, see if the electricity holds. But, but, um, but yeah, so uh, uh, thank you to Norman Borlaug for helping to grow so much so much more food and you really promote human life enormously you thank thank all of these great heroes and john and everybody out there in hero land you know, salute norman borlaug and uh i want to wish you john to have a more heroic day have a more have a heroic weekend and have a heroic day everybody you too Andy. <laughs>